for tuning in to this edition of Business Daily. Coming to you live from Seoul, I'm Izun. Before we get started, let's see what you can look forward to in the latter half of our program. You might not want to swap your hamburgers out for bug burgers just yet, but the Korean government is hoping to change that around by growing its edible insect market. We sit down with an expert to talk about a potential global shocker that could rattle the world economy come September. What troubles lie ahead and how can Korea hedge against what's to come? The two Koreas have finally agreed upon a wage hike for North Korean workers at their joint industrial complex in Kaesong. Sources close to the matter say the two sides have decided to raise the minimum wage by 5 percent, the same level at which the wage has been set every year. Seoul and Pyongyang had been entangled in a wage dispute for months because North Korea wanted wages increased by slightly under 5.2 percent for its 55,000 workers at the complex. On top of the wage hike agreement, the sources also say the two sides will hold a joint management committee meeting to discuss how to revise labor guidelines there. Korea's leading business groups saw some of some poor figures on the whole in the first half of this year. Newly released data show that their combined profits fell by roughly a fifth on year. Some of the big wigs in the boardrooms of major companies like Samsung Electronics saw their paychecks drop as a result. Our Song ji reports. Local market researcher Chebol.com says the net profit of listed firms among Korea's top 10 business groups stood at 15 billion U.S. dollars in the first half of this year. That's down 20 percent from the same period last year. Sales also dropped 8 percent to $263 billion. The slump was mainly due to slowing growth momentum in and out of Korea, and Samsung's disappointing figures, which accounted for more than half of the 10 groups' combined profits last year. Now that portion slid to just under 30 percent, with earnings dropping more than half to just $4.6 billion. While some others improved their profits, most saw their sales drop from a year earlier, showing a typical sign of recessive surplus. The market researcher also released figures that show board executives at Samsung Electronics saw their salaries drop in the first half of the year following slumping smartphone sales. Samsung posted an 8 percent fall in its net profit in the second quarter amid lackluster results in its flagship smartphone business despite the launch of ambitious new models. CEOs Shin jong -gyun, Kwon oh and Yoon bu -gun all received more than $1 million over the six-month period, but their paychecks had more than halved on average. Shin topped the list for the most paid executive last year at $10 million, but lost that title to Yu gyeong son head of Eugene Group, who took him $13 million, including severance pay. Song ji -sun, Business Daily. Korean memory chip makers continue to tighten their grip on the global DRAM market, hitting a new record high in terms of market share. According to market researcher DRAM Exchange on Tuesday, Samsung Electronics took up roughly 57.5 percent of the market in the second quarter, while its local rival SK Hynix held just under 24 percent. The combined figure accounts for 81.5 percent of the market, breaking the previous record of 75 percent posted in the January to March period. 10,500. That's how many extra workers in the country's largest automaker, Hyundai Motor Group, plans to hire this year. This includes the 9,500 new jobs it pledged to create earlier this year. It will mark the first time Hyundai Motor has taken on more than 10,000 new workers in a year. The automaker said its recent decision to adopt the so-called wage peak system for its older employees enabled it to take on the extra hires. Hyundai has vowed to expand the new payment system across the group, adding that it will ask for cooperation from labor unions from each business unit. Lotte Holdings shareholders only spent about 20 minutes of their time on Monday to reaffirm Shin Dongbin's control of the conglomerate based in Korea and Japan. So, is the succession battle all over? Our Shin Zemin has more. By winning the backing of shareholders at a key holding company, Lotte Holdings, it increasingly looks like the younger son of the Lotte founding family, Shin Dongbin, has secured his grip on management at Korea's fifth largest conglomerate. 
Lotte Holdings in Japan owns a 19% share in the group based in Korea, which is why many say the most recent decision carries as much weight as a collective ruling from the entire group. But pundits warn it's still early to tell whether the month-long family feud over succession has come to an end. Industry insiders say Shin Dong-ju, the first son of Lotte's founder, Shin Gyo-ko, may fire back and try to reclaim his control over the conglomerate. The elder son had earlier said he would seek to swap out the existing board and reinstate his father, who was demoted to honorary chairman. One of the ways he may seek to do that is by initiating another shareholders meeting. What poses greater uncertainties to whether this would work is the 92-year-old founder's physical and mental health. The senior Shin had until now backed his older son Tongju, but unpredictabilities still remain, and it's unclear if he will be willing to take a public stance on the issue once again. Although one step closer to sealing the fate of who will reign over Korea's largest retailer, an unprotected move by Shin Gyo-ko and his older son could spark a new battle on the succession front. Shin Se-min, Business Daily. A lot of you probably have those random cravings for pizza or chocolate, like me, but I bet this isn't on your list quite yet insects. Now, surprisingly, though, latest numbers show that Korea's edible insect market is growing as bugs are advertised more for their nutritional value and their taste. Our Lee Ji-young tells us more. From these cookies to pudding and a table full of desserts, it looks like any other setup of treats, but actually the main ingredient of these pastries are darkling beetles. The food is made out of powder produced from the grinds of freeze-dried larvae. It tastes quite nutty. The dishes that are made out of powder don't seem at all like they're from insects, so I had fun tasting them. Darkling beetles are one of the edible insects designated by the government last year as being safe to eat and rich in nutrients, having similar protein levels with beef or chicken. Around 77 percent is made up of unsaturated fatty acid, and it has a nice nutty flavor, so I think it can be applied to various dishes and menus for patients. As of now, the beetles can be used by companies to make food products upon approval from regulatory bodies. The state-run Rural Development Administration said Korea's edible insect market has grown from 45 million U.S. dollars in 2009 to 74 million this year and it's looking to expand the culinary potential of these six-legged creatures as it searches for new ways to help farmers turn profits and secure food resources in the future. The UN has also highlighted edible bugs as being an innovative solution to help meet the rising demand for meat that's forecast to double by 2050. While the practicality of this unconventional diet may appeal to some with its high nutritional value, Experts point out it could be a long way to go until people feel comfortable about enjoying a creepy crawly meal. Lee Ji-young, Business Daily. So the word in town is that the global economy might be in for some trouble come September. And this is stoking concerns about the Korean economy, which is currently dealing with problems from both in and outside of the country. Let's find out what this is all about. The global economy continues to be on edge following last week's surprise yuan devaluation from the People's Bank of China. And now eyes are on the U.S. Federal Reserve and when it will carry out its rate hike. With solid job growth, experts are saying this leaves Washington on track for a rate liftoff in September. But there are growing concerns that this move may create more market turbulence and drive down currencies, further destabilizing emerging economies. Korea is no exception when it comes to these external threats. Experts say a U.S. rate hike could lead to a capital outflow from Korea and emerging markets in search of higher returns gleaned from a rising U.S. dollar. Taking into account the Korean economy is already facing anemic exports and tepid household spending, what can Korea do to better prepare for looming trouble? 
And to tell us more about this, we're now joined by Professor Yang Jun Sok from the Catholic University of Korea. Hello there, Professor. Happy to be here. All right, so some are saying that trouble is brewing for the global economy come September. What is this based on and what kind of ugly surprises are we really talking about here? Okay, part of it is due to nervousness, part of it is due to past experience. I think the nervousness comes from, well, Korea has been, uh, has an experience with a financial crisis, so we've always uh, been uh, watching out for that, being nervous about it. Uh, there's been a news story in an American newspaper earlier this year saying that uh, most of the U.S. trade traders who are on the ground trading uh, stocks and bonds, uh, they never experienced a period of high interest rate because the U.S. has been running this policy for so long. Mm -hmm. So uh, some people are nervous because of those type of factors. And then uh, we look at the experience of two years ago, 2013. Um, there, was there were rumors that U.S. would raise its uh, interest rate at the time, and that that almost caused financial crisis in India uh, and Indonesia. And it also caused a lot of nervousness in Korea back mm. then as well as the uh, exchange rate fluctuated quite a bit. Uh, so there's those type of factors which are coming into play as well as a, a lot of global uncertainty that's been placed this year like Greece and then Chinese devaluation, uh, the uh, continuing Abenomics and so on. Uh, but having said that, I think compared to the situation of 2013, Mm -hmm. I think things are a lot more stable. Okay. Um, we don't see uh, as much global uh, instability as we did. There's a lot of concerns uh, that there might be financial crisis, but uh, compared to India in the summer of 2013, where they really almost uh, were just a few days away from a possible financial crisis, I think we've been handling this fairly well globally. All right, you talked a little bit about the U.S. Fed rate hike. I mean, there are expectations that they would do that come September. What's the outlook on that right now? Okay, I think unless Unless something really big comes up, I think they will be forced to raise the rates. Uh, that's because they've been uh, delaying the interest rate cut for a long time, even with a lot of Wall Street criticism. They've been dropping a lot of hints this year that they will finally raise it this year. Um, now, uh, the IMF uh, has written a report saying that they wish U.S. would raise the rates next year. There has been some comments that because of the Chinese devaluation, uh, perhaps U.S. should delay interest rate uh, rise until next year because that would appreciate the uh, U.S. dollar even more. But I think the credibility of the Fed is on the line. So unless there are some really big events coming up uh, that surprises everybody uh, in the next month or so, I think the uh, Fed will, in order to maintain its credibility, almost have to raise its uh, interest rate by 0.05%. Uh, All right, so for now, it looks like global markets kind of calmed down following last week's yuan devaluations, but then there is concern that if the Fed rate hike coupled with the devalued yuan, then it could cause some trouble for the global economy. I mean, how big of a problem are we talking about here? Okay, I think people are referring back to, say, 1994, uh, when we had the situation where the U.S. had very quick interest rate increases as well as large depreciation on the uh, Chinese yuan. Uh, I think the situation is a, a lot different here uh, because, first of all, the United States at the time raised the interest rate uh, s uh, from 3% to 6% in a period slightly more than a year. Now, that's a big rise by any standard, uh, and there has been concerns that uh, that was part of the fa reason why Mexico underwent a financial crisis and it uh, provided a seed for Asian financial crisis. But uh, we don't know how quick uh, the interest rate increase is going to be for the U.S. And the Fed has been saying over and over that if interest rate increases come, they will try to do it as slowly as possible. Uh, so uh, there are some reasons for worry, but I think we're, uh, in a sense, uh, worrying because of the possible scenario that it would take rather than uh, something that's uh, definitely set. All right. Well, there have been past precedents, like you said before, when the global economy was faced with, let's say, the yeah. double whammy. But um, how does the state of the global economy compare then and now? Okay. Well, uh, as I said before, I think we're in a lot weaker economy than we uh, we were in 1994. Uh, back then, the United States was coming off of the recession, and it was growing a lot faster than people realized, partially because that was when the uh, dot-com bubble started. Uh, now. 
I don't think we're going to have the same problem here because while the U.S. has been recovering, its recovery has been slower than everybody uh, hoped it would be. Now, I think there are some uh, people who are concerned because of cases like that where the uh, United States tried to hold down growth and uh, it was too strong. Mm -hmm. But given the numbers that we see so far, that doesn't seem to be the case uh, because while the uh, late, uh, unemployment is going down in the United States, the wage in Inflation is not going up very much, and uh, a lot of the jobs, uh, even though there, there has been a cut in unemployment, a lot of those jobs are still part-time. So okay. I think the recovery is weaker than some people, uh, at least just by looking at the numbers, feel. All right, then how should Korea prepare for a possible September shocker? Okay, well, Korea, as usual, can't do, really do a lot about the global economy. Mm -hmm. uh, so the best we can do is monitor. Uh, now. Uh, the thing that they should be monitoring is whether there will be a capital outflow. Uh, if there's a very rapid capital outflow like uh, 2013 uh, or 2008, then government should definitely take bold measures. But if it's only a slight capital outflow, which is probably likely the case because that's what we've seen in the last few years. Korea has reduced its interest rate, but the capital outflow hasn't been as large. Uh, so. Uh, if the capital outflow is uh, relatively small, then it's just a natural market reaction. So uh, government should probably just let it uh, go ahead. And that would actually be, I think, helpful for Korea because it will help depreciate the won. And everybody's been worried about won being too strong lately. Right. Okay. Thank you so much for your insight today, Professor. Thank you. And that will do it for me. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back tomorrow with more fun in-depth business news that matters to you. Thanks for watching and see you soon.